it shouldn't be the experience. Because I think if you're relying on the tech to be the experience, it's going to feel very trend focused. You have to have a strong anchor in why are you creating this space? What do you want people to feel? And what are the best tools to help evoke that? Welcome back to another episode of Barriers to Entry, a podcast where every episode we get into it with the leaders, the designers, the early adopters, and the influencers who are helping to shape what Web3, the metaverse, the blockchain, and more are going to mean for the architecture and design industry. I'm Tessa Bain, and I'm joined by my very esteemed, very lovely, intelligent, even. Wow. Co-host, Andrew Lane and Bobby Bonet. I'm blushing. I'm yeah. Like, were any of those meant for either of us in particular or? I mean, it's both, but like you're not just pretty faces. That. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's what we're here yeah. for, the compliments. That's amazing. Plugs guy here, Bobby Bonet. We're here at the podcast studio at Pen One in mm -hmm. New York City. Thanks to Vornado for affording us the opportunity to record in here. And we're, we're going to be talking about an exciting interview with a dreamer today that we just got out. And it's a little bit, it's a little bit festive, really. Yeah, we have a really, I think there's a little bit of magic in the podcast air today as we welcome a guest who has spent a long career in the physical world, a very classically trained designer with a lot of, of heritage in that world, who really followed a dream that started with a, a Christmas story. Yeah. So Colleen Newell, who's founder of the In Between Studios, you'll hear her share about how her passion for this project started when she was a child. And I'm sure that's a story that so many of our listeners can share in their journeys in the architecture and design industry. And she takes the design thinking process and sort of turns it on its head and goes from what is maybe traditional and linear into something that is an ecosystem of creativity. So I'm really excited for our listeners to get a chance to learn more about what that means. Yeah, Colleen's got a really interesting experiential and experimental project that we're going to hear all about the way that she thought about bringing together advisors, the way she pu pulled a team together, and really what it is that they're ultimately trying to create, which is a project that has a real interesting iteration to it, moving and evolving as the times change and as the technology emerges too. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about this is I'm not even sure that Colleen knows exactly where this is going to land, but the vision is big, that's for certain. Well, and that's what's really cool about it is that she said she's had this dream and this vision for so many years, and it's the technology now and the metaverse applications and how we can use AR and VR, AI, that are actually allowing this vision and this dream that she's had for so long to come to life. And this is why show notes are important, because we're going to talk about some technologies and some concepts today with Colleen. While we won't define them over the course of the podcast episode, make sure to check out the show notes on surroundpodcasts.com to learn more about all of these concepts. Yeah, yeah, the plug man. I think that that is a great intro. Maybe we can bring those sleigh bells back as we go into a really exciting exploration of what your imagination can make possible with all this new technology. Let's get to the interview with Colleen. All right. We are excited because the gang is actually all in person today, which is a rare feat here at the Sandow Design Group podcast studios. Thanks for having us in, Bobby. It's very exciting to be here. This is an audio-only podcast, but you can't see the free water and snacks that are just piling on top <laughs> of us here. It's an amazing place to be. We're located at Pen One in New York City, and we want to give a shout-out. We usually plug at the end, but shout-out at the beginning of the pod to our partners at Vernado, who have created this great space. And we're excited because we actually have a guest here in person as well. Joining us at the table today, someone who was part dreamer, part founder, Embarking on a fascinating project, really bridging the worlds of physical and into digital design and creating something very cool in the metaverse. Colleen Newell, welcome to the pod. Thank you. It's so incredible to be here. I've been dreaming about our chat for weeks now, and I'm really excited. Amazing. We wanted to get started just giving everyone more of a sense of kind of who you are, how you got here, what you got you into Web3. You had a story that you shared when we were kind of pre-record about a winter visit to Higby's that led you on the path. And I think that, you know, most metaverse stories begin in Cleveland, but we really, we really <laughs> want to hear how this one plays out. <laughs> hilarious. Yeah, this is, it is quite specific. It's one of those core memories, if you will. When I was a kid, my mom would take us down to downtown Cleveland, which had its, you know, fantastic department store in its one skyscraper. So Higby's turns into Twigby's at the holiday time, and it's a magical place to go where it, they built a two-story castle that was covered in iridescent glitter. 
And it was the proportions of that of a kid. So it was made special just for you. And you'd get a little piece of paper that had parents, grandparents, siblings, et cetera, on it. And you would have to tick off who you were shopping for. And you'd get to go in and choose these items yourself. And they were, you know, silly trinkets, but it was just this idea of having been a little kid and go, walking into a space that was created just for you. And all of the things you were selecting were things that you selected. And it just felt transformative. And then you would take the elevator upstairs to the top floor where the Silver Grill restaurant was. And it was a beautiful white tablecloth kind of fancy establishment that had, you know, a lovely lunch. But really the point of it was that you didn't want to finish your lunch as a kid because if you didn't, they would bring it to you in the most beautiful presentation. So either, you know, a silver foil swan, which was beautiful and lovely, but really you were hoping and holding out for the cardboard oven that hmm. had actual doors that opened. So you'd open the doors and your food would be in there waiting for you. And then when you got to go home, obviously it was endless hours of play. So it just felt, you know, it's one of those experiences that unfortunately just aren't around in the same way where every detail was paid attention to. And it was all about creating an experience for you, which sure inspires more commerce in most opportunities in most cases, but it really was a magical experience. And it stayed with me my whole life. Clearly. Yeah. I should mention elementary schools still do these little craft fairs, uh, holiday time, little shops. And so we give each of my daughters a couple bucks to take. And my oldest daughter, Arlene, was asking for $10 to get herself something this year, <laughs> which killed me. But she was very thoughtful about everybody else she was getting as well. So you're really, <laughs> since then, it's been about experiences for you. That's yeah, what that it, drives you and motivates it's you. It's been about experiences and beauty. And I certainly didn't have the vocabulary at the time, but design. And really that every detail throughout that design process was paid attention to. And it was seamless ever since then, for sure. Tell us a little bit about your architecture and design creds and your journey. So we've started with Colleen as a kid in the yeah. Cleveland skyscrapers, and then you <laughs> enter the workforce shortly thereafter, I guess. Uh -huh. And what happens? You're destined to build the Cleveland skyline. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Cleveland. It's a beautiful city. It's and perfect for creatives. It's really quite special. It's just a small little slice of fantasticness. So I went to the Cleveland Institute of Art, which at the time was the only five-year art school in the country and felt really compelling to spend two years of foundation and then three years in your major, which was such a luxury. I was a fiber and materials studies major, and I really focused on fabric as architecture. Then the intention really was to create evocative experiences where you influence the environment and the environment influenced you, whereas typically it's one directional. And then I also studied at Parsons in interior architecture and had an incredible educational experience and reached out to Dongia at the time, high-end furniture and textile company to the trade, and interned there and met some of my closest friends that are still my friends today and felt incredibly privileged and lucky to work under Sherry Dongia, Allison Kettlewell, who now has Kettlewell Collection. Just a really spectacular group of people. And then met John Robshaw. So John Robshaw Textiles, I worked with him for a number of years. And then Terrain, I was part of the founding team there that built the concept and as well as launched the brand Terrain under the Urban Inc. umbrella, which was fantastic to be able to launch a home brand that, you know, they're fashion experts. And so to do Home and Garden felt really quite special. Consulted for a number of years, and then I spent the better part of nine years at ABC Carpet and Home as Executive Vice President of Design and Merchandising, leading creative and the business side. So what was it that led you from this great role at a major company like ABC Carpet to strike out on your own, and in particular to go from such a tactile background mm -hmm. into something that's a lot more digital and non-physical? It's such a great question. ABC Carpet and Home, for those that know it, and certainly those that are New Yorkers, for decades and decades has been a wonderland of discovery. And it was really, I would say, the founders of experiential retail, when you think of mm. bricks and mortar retail and kind of walking through those doors and, and just getting lost in the beauty and in the storytelling. And I had the privilege of having what I would imagine, or at least to me, it was one of the best jobs in the world for a number of years. I had these experiences traveling the world and seeing culture and seeing incredible design, incredible architecture, going into the most beautiful synagogues and chapels and places of worship, for instance, because it's such an important part of culture. It's something ABC, we would always go in whatever country we were in. And ABC was so rich for that physical experience. And yet 
was, for lack of a better term, a bit of a dinosaur when it came to technology, right? Because it had been so long established and so known for its physical presence that adoption of tech and evolution into tech was slow and, and painful. And it was frustrating to try to express to people the magic of walking through those doors digitally based on the tools that we had, the budgets that we had, et cetera. And sharing that magic was difficult. And that stays with you. And certainly the ideas that most drive and inspire me lend themselves to the, the hybrid and thinking of all the things that I've learned at ABC and how do I take what's meaningful and move it forward. Are there moments you recall where maybe pre-metaverse you were thinking, what is a virtual manifestation of these magical in-person moments that I'm experiencing? If there was something we could do digitally or online, I'd love to sink my teeth into it. Honestly, a number of years ago, I just thought, what's the next wave of entrepreneurs? I feel really frustrated, past tense, by the endless scroll and this search for product. And I think of how eBay changed Web2, how mm -hmm. Etsy changed the game for makers, artisans, designers. And what was the next evolution of that? How do you experience versus just view, have a non-interactive experience with product. And that got me thinking, I have a real passion and a real drive to bring innovation to the way that we experience physicalness. You saw this happening all around you. What does it feel like to have these progressive thoughts when you're working in an environment where you just don't see it moving forward? And for people out there who are in those sort of similar situations, how did you internalize and break through that? It's a great question. At ABC it was pretty specific. And I wouldn't necessarily say that this is the advice that I would give to others, but the physical magic outweighed often the pain of some of the other that I just thought, sure, I could go somewhere else, but there's no one bridging the gap with both in the ways that I wanted, that it still felt like the physical magic carried a lot of weight that drove me to stay and to stay focused then on how do you make the most of, of what you have? And how do you be the best storyteller and the best experience provider with what you have? I think now it's a game changer. The fact that Web3 is many things to many people, and I'm sure we can all talk and have a slightly different definition of what it is, but it really is empowering creatives. And I think the ability to create as a lo-fi an experience as you want, as well as an elaborate experience, but the time is now. But it's important still to have that physical component, right? For me, it's critical. Like that is the impetus and the inspiration for the work that I'm up to. And I think that's the most interesting place when you're seeing that transfer of physical to digital and vice versa. So can you tell us about what you're up to? Sure. I'm working to create a brand called The In-Between, I-N-B-T-W-N. And it's all about the space between reality and fantasy. So I say it's a bit of Eloise for those that might have an awareness of that reference, 50s-ish book based on a little girl who grew up in the Plaza Hotel. But a bit of Eloise meets Willy Wonka meets Tim Burton. And we're really on a journey to create an immersive, natively digital experience. That's a hotel, restaurant, theater, e-commerce with a gamified foundation. So when you're designing a hybrid experience, where do you start? Do you typically start physical first or do you lead with digital first? It's interesting because I've mentioned that we're launching digitally first, but really the inception and the evolution of the design started with the physical. And for me, it's that flashback to that core memory of the magic of having something created just for you. I have a very clear vision of what we're looking to create physically. And that when you think of a typical hotel experience, we can put them in a few buckets. There's the luxury spa, there's your work hotel, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. But to create an experience that's luxury, that's high-end, every detail is considered. And yet, there is a deeper meaning. There is a deeper experience happening. I can talk through what a room experience would be like. Each floor in the hotel experience will have a different theme, if you will. And you can either choose your theme or you can take a quiz and be assigned should you not want to choose. So there's a celestial floor, for instance. And you walk into that room and you're immediately transported. As soon as you put your foot down, the subflooring is a, a commercial foam surface that has a bit of buoyancy. So there's a bit of give as you're walking over the floor. So it's mimic that sensory experience of walking on the surface of the moon. And then all of the windows are stained glass 
really delicate, beautiful, fine stained glass with light projecting through. As you walk in, you're immersed in refractions of light mimicking the cosmos. And you have almost a spiritual experience kind of in that room. And what is your engagement like? And there's all sorts of conversation we could go into the design. But then how that translates digitally, that same room that you feel like something's happening, digitally, you actually can float because we're not limited by the same constraints of physics and gravity and whatnot that we are in the physical world. So the physical 100% came first, but then the liberation came when thinking about how to translate it digitally. Quick interruption to this episode because I want to tell you all about another podcast that I think you'll enjoy. It's called Looking Forward, and it's from our good friend Ryan Anderson, who is the VP of Global Research and Insights at Miller Knoll. The show is all about the future of the workplace, particularly in the A&D industry, which you know is a topic we love here at Barriers to Entry. You got to check out Looking Forward if you're like us and want to push the conversation around what exactly works at work. The show is part of the Surround Podcast Network, just like Barriers to Entry. So go take a listen at surroundpodcasts.com or follow Looking Forward wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Vonage. Is your business ready to integrate live video chats into your app? The Vonage Video API makes it simple for developers to build custom solutions that make sense for your business. From providing faster tech support and better customer service to hosting more productive meetings and classes, live video enhances every conversation. Go live on your terms with Vonage. Learn more at Vonage.com. I really appreciate the choose your own adventure <laughs> nature. Who do you think about is your target visitor? Because I'm interested in the fact that a lot of your inspiration comes from an experience you had when you were younger. And the way you're explaining the celestial floor, I could imagine a, a toddler or an adult going in and saying, oh my goodness, this is pretty far out. So are you designing for a certain persona? Where does that start in your head? It's interesting. It's a really great question because I would say originally because the idea did come from the roots as a memory from childhood, I was thinking that it would be focused more on children. But I've been working on this for about a year. I've been dreaming of it forever, but really building it and building team and whatnot for the last year. And in all of my meetings, investors, potential partners, advisors, et cetera, all the feedback has been, when can I go? And it's really shifted thinking we're all yearning for it. We're all yearning for those experiences that challenge how is this possible? My intention is to create this sanctuary, if you will. So when you think of bringing like a three-year-old, which I have and adore more than anything in this whole world, hmm. he'll have a great time. But I don't think he'll appreciate all the design details it's really intended to speak to. Well, it's kind of like Disney when they... They put those jokes in that are just for adults, mm -hmm. but really the movie is for the children. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit like that. Yeah. So are you foreseeing this as being in a physical permanent location? Do you see this as being something that is potentially installation based and travels about? Following to Bobby's point about the audience, where do you kind of find the place that brings this to life for people so that people can access an experience like this? Sure. Well, digitally, it'll be available everywhere. When I was really thinking of the physical build, that's really where the idea had its roots. The two things that I struggled with were technology, because I want the physical experience, I want you to be very present and not distracted by the technology. And then accessibility, because it will be a high-end luxury experience. And I don't want to necessarily limit the people that can take part in this realm, as I'm referring to it. So digitally, it'll be globally, and it will really encourage interaction so you can participate, and we can get more into it, I believe, later. But you can participate on your own, or you can really build team and, and collaborate with those globally. We're launching digitally first. So the physical, we're still a few years out, and my dream location is in New York City to build the full physical realm. There will be these pop-up immersive timed experiences that can travel and be in many different destinations. But... The full physical realm will start in New York, but I have visions of how this will be a global brand. Are you thinking about gamification as part of this as well? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. It's part of the magic that Web3 and the metaverse is allowing us to see both in participant designing and building in and contributing their vision and layering in their experiences, 
But really, the gamification it starts off as a scavenger hunt and evolves into a quest game. I can't share all details now, but little bits like... Would that be just like um, a game, like a cheat code? Is this? <laughs> no, because I don't want to reveal it all. That's what's so exciting, <laughs> sure. right, is that it continues to evolve. But a lot of the two-dimensional artwork, for instance, will be a curation of children's artwork that digitally deconstructs or reconstructs to give you clues and guide you on your way. And there's a number of other little clues. I think we'll get into a few things about how I see guides as a huge part of the hotel experience, both physically and digitally in a bit. You know, you said that you don't want the tech to pull people from being present in the moment. How are you planning on integrating the technology in a way that's not distracting, like with the guides and along that line? You have all these thoughts as you're first building something and then you learn and then you think, oh, there's maybe a different way or a better way. And originally I was thinking that AR would be the main tech that would be leveraged for the hotel. And I was thinking that glasses would really be the way to go. Obviously, there's an expense to that hardware, as well mm -hmm. as the hardware still has a bit to go to get really to where I want it to be. So many people are doing incredible experiences using AR with their phone. And mm -hmm. it's amazing because it's very site specific. Mm -hmm. Because it's so immersive, I don't want to have the distraction of someone holding up their phone or their iPad or not being present. So I think where we've landed is that it will be engineered projection mapping that'll support much of the tech in the physical experience. There'll be other layers, but that'll be one of the main. So a lot will be very choreographed. You have a lot of different media, physical, digital, AR, VR, all these things. <laughs> How did you pull this together into a story to bring partners and investors on board to start to make this a reality? Yeah, it's big. As I yeah. tell people all the time, and even as I'm pitching it, I, I say, I, I see, I know how big this is and even talking through it. But I believe in it with every bit of my being. And so it makes it easy to talk about. I started building the story. What's the story architecture? Why am I doing this? What's the goal? Who is the customer? And again, that changes and evolves. And you just have to be open and flexible to how that evolves. And then building out a deck that helped me just as much as it helped whomever I was sharing it with and pitching it to and layering in all of the different components. And then it's building a kick-ass advisor team and really working with them to say, this is how I envision rolling it out. How do you feel? How can we get to an MVP? All of those kind of tough conversations. And you lean into your expertise, but you also really rely on the team that you've built to help make the best decisions. You talked about pulling together your advisory board. I think it'd be great if you could just tell us a little bit more about how you thought about what that group was and how you brought them together and got them aligned and working towards your vision. Sure. For me, it's been a pretty organic process. As you're building these ideas, you tend to want to reach out to those that you trust first as you're incubating and holding things close. And your inner circle tends to be those maybe you've worked with in the past, know you really well, know the field that you're interested in. So I reached out to those people first and gauged interest as well as participation. There were certain people that were really fired up to want to keep talking and, and also wanted to support me and really believed in the vision. And then there were areas like tech, for instance, as I've shared, wasn't the strength of ABC. So as much as I've been in, enormously interested and incredibly passionate about it, I haven't spent years and years building in it. So I needed to find the right tech support, if you will, and the right tech advisor and networked like crazy to find the right person. And I'm super psyched. How do you know when you hit the right fit? I get really passionate, <laughs> really excited. And when that person can meet my passion, it's done. I'm sure you deal with doubters along the way. And it's not like all of the press we hear about Web3 and the metaverse mm -hmm. and cryptocurrency is universally positive. So no, crypto is pretty positive, I think, Bobby. <laughs> So when you're when you get whether it's like just a pregnant pause or somebody mm -hmm. saying, Colleen, you're out of your dang mind. Obviously, there's no lack of confidence because you're so passionate about this. But I'm sure there are moments where you probably say, oh, my goodness, I'm doing something that's pretty wild. Sure. There's moments I've had. I can think of one meeting in particular that really got me down and it wasn't even bad. It was just like, a, hey, this is super cool. It's just not for me. Mm -hmm. And you just can't go into things attached. Um, and I did. I went into that meeting feeling attached that this person, it would resonate and it didn't. So it really bumped me out and got me down for a day or two. And I just thought there's going to be a lot of people along the way that have that response or worse. And I just have to keep moving because I know that this is meaningful and it's going to be um, it's going to be special. 
I think that's really relatable that we've all had those days Mm -hmm. and we've all had those moments and it's how you react to them. So I like that no to attachment, I think. (laughs) It's a good reminder. I'm going to take a bit of a tangent too and ask you a question that I think might interest a lot of the designers and interior architects out there right now. You're clearly a dreamer and a visionary, Mm -hmm. a big imagination. And you're you know, finding ways to make it very tangible, which is exciting. The market's sort of moving towards this demand for cross-hybrid spaces. I mean, we hate the word digital, but <laughs> the mix of a digital and a physical experience together. Mm-hmm. You know, what kind of advice can you give the community to start thinking outside the box in, in building these spaces? This is my point of view, right? So we can all only come to something with your own individual perspective, but... In the physical experience, I want the tech to be an enhancement to the experience. It shouldn't be the experience because I think if you're relying on the tech to be the experience, it's going to feel very trend focused and the tech's going to evolve in two days anyway. It just moves so fast. So you have to have a strong anchor in why are you creating this space? What do you want people to feel? And mm-hmm. what are the best tools to help evoke that. And designers and architects are who's better at deciding how to get those messages across. Mm -hmm. And you're applying this in in your case to hospitality, but do you Mm -hmm. see this as something that can apply to other industries or other segments? Sure. I mean, retail, Mm -hmm. I think, as we've talked a little bit, he was like the antithesis of tech forward. And yet they nailed journey experience all day long. I think to, to truly succeed in that space, it's all about finding the right balance of experience to product. You could have the best experience in the world, but if your product is shit, Mm -hmm. it's not going to go very far. So if we can get the tech in a retail experience to not only make the experience of, say, checkout smoother, that's cool. That's great. I also really like humans. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to interact with them. Mm -hmm. You think of different ways that projection can participate in retail, storytelling, A lot of times we rely on cards, if you will, physical card to tell a story of a maker or a product or something. But to create a somewhat immersive experience, sound, rely on your senses and see how technology can enhance what we're already given. You've mentioned a couple of the components of the experience that you're most excited about. So could you pick one or two and maybe the guides and explain to our listeners what makes you excited about the experience and why the format you're thinking about for the in-between is really the only format where that experience could come to life? Sure. Typically, you walk into a hotel experience, physical hotel experience, and you see a bellman, concierge, the hotel team, if you will, there to support you. I really want to create a new language for what this experience can be like. Right now, for lack of a better term, which will evolve, but I've landed on guides. And really, the significance of that is these guides in the physical world. There's something more to them. So that projection mapping that I was talking about will interact with the hotel team, these guides, so that as you're checking in or as you're interacting, someone might turn slowly or raise an arm and you suddenly see a bit of magic dust falling from a shoulder or you see a flutter of a wing, just to indicate there's definitely something more happening. And then when you join in the digital experience and you're really in the game, you see that that guide has fully transformed into the Firefly, which is Mm -hmm. the brand icon for the in-between. And there's lots of symbolism we can get into about Fireflies, but, but they turn into Fireflies and they help guide you throughout your experience. And there's a language they have to decode and there's emotional states and it's quite the really fantastic game. Yeah, a lot of layers. So tell us a little bit more about the design inspiration and the general aesthetic. Sure. Well, one of my kind of oldest references of inspiration is Art Nouveau. That period and what came out of it is an endless source of inspiration for me. I love the femininity of it. I love, you know, you kind of strip away some of that ornamentation And it's just mind-blowing. It feels, it's so forward. The biomimicry, again, the elegant lines. So if you take that and you kind of push it forward into the technology that we have available today, like 3D printing, laser cutting, CNC, it's pretty mind-blowing what can be created. So that's really the foundation of the aesthetic. It, It is a more feminine perspective, I would say, overall. The ultimate realization of this experience Do you see it as something that's fully gamified or is it actually something that could be transformative to the industry where people actually stay in these hotels in the way that you're imagining this coming to life? A hundred percent. It will certainly be a game and there will be people that participate in the game portion of it. And we haven't really gotten into this, but you think of NFTs and sure, there's a whole movement and population of people that 
are really responding to NFTs for the quality of artwork mm -hmm. that they possess. You know, what I really respond to about NFTs is the utility potential that they offer. I think that can really revolutionize kind of how hotel experiences are and even uh, restaurant experiences. I want to change the industry and I want to up the bar on what service, good service can be considered. Small goals. Like, yeah, yeah, just little ones. <laughs> You must be Scratching waking up service. in the middle of the night yeah. writing down a new yeah. idea. The yeah. amount of layers is impressive and yeah. it's exciting. And I'm wondering how to get on the wait list. Yeah. And... <laughs> yeah. yeah, soon enough. We'll be launching the signups for waitlist shortly. So I think I'm not exactly sure at the time of this airing, but it will be soon. Before we wrap up today, we mm -hmm. just want to get a sense of advice that you might give our listeners on where they can get started or what resources they can access to dig in further on this space. Sure. As I said, tech was not my strongest suit. So I dove in headfirst into everything that's out there at our fingertips. LinkedIn is actually a surprisingly great resource. Kathy Hackle, thought leader, love her journey. And in particular, there's so many interesting things. Discord, super interesting, really foreign for those that aren't. Get past the Discord user guy. Exactly. Yeah. It's not pretty, <laughs> but there's a ton of information there and it's been super fun to engage in that, reading a ton, listening to podcasts. Two of my favorites, Kathy Hackle's Her Ad Week podcast. And I also really love Luke Frank's Welcome to the Metaverse. The other thing I will say, engage in the space. So probably not the best time to say, buy a little crypto. But what I mean by that is just know how to do it. So buy a little crypto, go from your like hot storage, cold storage, understand what it means, buy an NFT, mint an NFT, just so that you can really see what at kind of a base layer is happening. It's really just scratching the surface. Those are just foundational pieces. So and Colleen so suggests that we buy the dip. Yeah. <laughs> this is not Pretty financial much. advice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming and joining us at the wonderful Work Life Meetings podcast space here at Vernado Properties. That's our last plug, I think, for the day. But we wanted to thank you so much for your time and for sharing the vision for this incredible product with us. Really excited and looking forward to seeing people signing up and being a part of the world that you're going to create from the origins way back in Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you guys so much. This was so fun. Thank you. All right. And if you haven't been following along with your hot cocoa, we hope you enjoyed our first Christmas episode of Barriers to Entry. But really, we hope that you love that conversation with Colleen as much as we did. The thing that got me the most excited, you guys, was just the way in which we're seeing that technology is really starting to catch up with imagination and all of this. That if you can create something in your mind, the tech is rapidly becoming available to realize how you can execute that in both physical and digital and hybrid worlds. And I think that that's just an exciting place to be in an industry of creators, in an industry of intellectual property at a time when we have a society that's really becoming more accustomed and even craving these kinds of digital experiences. The things we're going to be able to deliver for them are really impressive. And I, I think we heard about that in, in some concrete ways today. I really loved her passion. You know, like I thought that she was so inspiring and she dreams big and she thinks big. And I really love how she applied that to her actual process and the way she speaks about how she designs. It's one thing to be passionate, but Colleen's ability to blend that with her entrepreneurial nature is really impressive. She is determined by this idea that has been in some way in in her mind since she was a child. And there's clearly with Colleen no taking no for an answer. The ideas and the concept and the project and the experiences are evolving on a regular basis. And that's why, as somebody who's only spoken to Colleen a handful of times, I'm a huge believer in her. And I'm excited to see what the in-between winds up looking at. And I'll be one of those people on that waiting list. Yeah, it's interesting, the, the degree. And it's something that we actually talk about a lot at Digby, which is just the energy around the partners that we work with. We think it's so important to be on the same page as the people that you're going to be spending your time with. I think one of the interesting things about that is just that balance of having also people who can keep you real and check and make sure that you are making the right decisions. But at the same time, you need to be hearing that from people who you trust and people who you have the right kind of energy from. And it sounds like she's created that network, which is so important for an entrepreneur. It was certainly an inspiring podcast and it was magical and... Sprightly. Yeah, sprightly. And I think that there's going to be a few extra trips to Cleveland, perhaps this holiday season. 
off the back of this. Cleveland, not yet a podcast sponsor, but perhaps soon we shall see. Speaking of plugs, Bobby, uh, do we have anything that we want to plug before we head out today? Obviously, want to start by plugging Christmas. That's a given. Big, yes, huge fan. Big, big fan. So you can learn about the In Between Studios now at Colleen's new website, theinbetween.xyz. That's T H E I N B T W N dot X Y Z. Barriers to Entry is produced by the studio by Sandow. Sam, Wise, Hannah, thank Love you. you. Guys. If you can hear us from here, thank you. Happy holidays to those three. Especially those three. Remember, you can get Barriers to Entry on any major podcast platform. And after you search the podcast and you find it on Spotify or you find it on Apple Podcasts, I want you with all of the might in your index finger to slam on the follow button. Slam it down like a hot cup of eggnog. And then follow that up with five stars. Okay? Absolutely. Because this, this is a five-star gang right here. That is important. And remember, Barriers to Entry available on the Surround Podcast Network surroundpodcasts.com don't forget the s the, the s extra is, x is for savings and yeah why don't you take us home tess you know gentlemen i hope that santa treats you well I maybe that extra s is for santa actually well it could be it mm. hope that you get everything that you desire this year and for our listeners out there our holiday wish for you is that we've managed to break down your barriers to entry Discover more with Surround, a podcast network from Sandow Design Group, featuring the architecture and design industry's go-to shows. Surround is the hub for creative conversations, endless inspiration, and design resources. Hear from tastemakers, researchers, designers, and architects themselves. Trending now on Surround is The Mic from NYC by Design, hosted by Debbie Melman. Learn more at surroundpodcasts.com. 